Utopia tonight. Hey, uh, John, that is the most brilliant um, montage of dystopia I've seen in a while. Loved it. Thank you so much. I really, I like to get my guests' opinion up because sometimes they're looking at it and they're like, I'm going to leave now. And then other times I feel like they really enjoy it. Works for me. I feel Thank very you. Yeah. 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 It was a lot of, I, we, we, I started this during the pandemic. So we, I just grabbed everything I could <laughs> that I felt like was just filling me full of dread. Well, maybe and, as of today, you can add um, two Olympians pulling out of the U.S. Olympic teams. To yes. I told my people, if I'm going on John's dystopia tonight, there's no controlling what I say. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what we like here, man. Anything sure. goes. All right. Um, I love. I want to get into a little bit because I always like to start off with people who've been uh, – because you've had an amazing career. You're still going strong. But, I mean, like, you've done – fucking everything but again you started out as a stand-up and how and you still do you still do stand-up right I still do. yes i do yeah is that so what how long were you doing because i feel like when when you guys like when your crew you know started back in the day or whatever there was uh like a little bit of a period of um you know doing the kind of did you start in new york i started in new york in college that's right before okay. i moved to LA. Okay, before you move to LA. Yeah, I feel like there's that crew that goes to, you know, the catch, the comic strip, that kind of thing in the beginning. And then there's like, uh, you know, a little bit of the road, and then it transitions into writing and stuff like that. Was that your path? So I'm trying to think of that my path. Not quite, because mm -hmm. when I got into stand up, it was during the boom. Okay. And so I had a day job in LA mm -hmm. working for them. Um, this accounting firm that handled all A-list celebrities, like literally managed their money. So I would wow. see these gigantic paychecks. I would sometimes have to deliver a hundred thousand dollar paycheck to the director of All in the Family, John Rich. Oh my yeah. God! That kind of job. So I was had that job during the day, and I would do open mic and gigs at night around Southern California, bars and restaurants. And mm -hmm. I started to get good enough that legitimate headliners started recommending me to out of town clubs. And wow. I was able, you couldn't do this now, but I was able to quit my day job and support myself full time as a comedian. Beautiful. beautiful? Yeah, you can't do that today at all. Not do it today. No. So I would travel the whole country first as an opening act mm -hmm. then as what we call a middle act. Although a lot of clubs don't have middles anymore. And then I yeah. became a headliner and I did that. I think within seven years, I was headlining a lot of places. Wow. And see, you know what's crazy? I feel like that's the that that also has changed too because we call you see when you say opening act, it was just you and the comedian, or there were three of you? There were three of us. So that's what I, I thought. I, yeah, I would MC. I would come out mm -hmm. like that, then introduce the feature or middle act. Yeah. Then they'd get off. I would come back on, do a little time, and then bring on the headliner. But there were see, three of us total. I think I feel like back then, and correct me if I'm wrong, the MC had to be good because the MC is no longer considered the opening act. The MC is non-existent, and then the feature is the opening act. Which is so weird to me, and right. not cool. And you're right. I think first of all, there was more pressure to be good as an opener. Especially yeah, they they flew me in and put me in a hotel. Like you mm -hmm. couldn't screw around. You had to be decent. Yeah, yeah. It, it's just I mean everything changed from back then. Like I feel like when I. <laughs> When I was growing up, man, I'm such a huge comedy nerd. I loved, I had all the books. I had um, Comic Insights. I had, um, you know, uh, the one that, there's one book, I swear to God, when I got, when I was in high school, where they just followed Richard Lewis around. I don't even know what book it was. Uh huh. Um, but I had all that stuff. And I just used to hear about, you know, the, the order of things, the money, when you got to a certain level. And then I started, I've been doing it for 16 years. I started in 2005. All that was gone. <laughs> there was none of that. None of that. And it's even changed. You know, when I did stand up, this whole thing of bring them shows where you had to pack. Yeah. That's absurd because yeah. you're not getting an honest response 
if it's your friends and family coming to see you, right? Yep. The yeah. only test of a comedian is performing to complete strangers. Yes. That's how you know if you're any good. That's what I used to tell people. I, thankfully, I didn't have to do them for very long. When I started, I did a couple bringers, hated every minute of it because the, the pressure to bring 15 people, and then if you don't bring enough people, they'll cut your time. So you don't, you're, you're dragging, if you can, strangers off of it, you know, just to make sure you can get your time in. You're not even worried about your fucking material at that point. So it's, it's like, it's brutal. And then also like, uh, you run out of friends. You're like, hey, do you want to come see? And they're like, is it the same five minutes? Because no. Exactly. I, I, yeah. Like, that's so counterintuitive to working on good material, right? Exactly. So I would find like other shows to do, but I got picked up by headliners early on and taken out. Thank God they took me out on the road because I didn't have to do any of that shit. Yeah. Uh, for too long. Um, but I'm so glad you said that because I very rarely get like a, a established people on here talking about how shitty bringer shows where it just looks like I'm complaining. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree. So who was your, who was your guy? Who did you wind up hanging out with back in the day? Like everybody has their class, you know? Right. So my class was really a mixture of uh, Bob Zaney, if you know him. I do, yeah. Do, yeah, and he was really good to me because he booked a lot of clubs in Southern mm -hmm. California besides being a comedian himself. So, Which is always the best. Always the best. So he gave me a lot of stage time. Um, Bob Saget was really good to me early in my career. This nice. was before he was on Full House or, or was a huge TV star. But mm -hmm. um, he was a top headliner at the comedy store, and he took a liking to me. And he got me my first TV gig. Do you remember briefly? He was on the CBS Morning Show, opposite the, the Today Show. Yeah. And he was like the funny host. So they, they started a thing where they'd have on comedians for two minutes only, pre-taped. Wow. We taped it at CBS Television City, mm -hmm. and um, they just used two two minutes of my act. But wow. it was real, so, so cool that I got to – do it with Bob. Um, and then a few years later, my crew was David Spade, Fred Wolf, um, oh, nice. Sandler a bit, Judd Apatow and I were really tight. Wow. Back then, yeah. So Very that cool. I love Spade, man. I feel like he's such, he's, everybody loves him who, who like works with him and stuff, but I feel like he's just a, like an underrated comic. Like he's yeah. so funny, so sharp. I agree with you. And, you know, Chris Rock always says Spade's the funniest motherfucker of anyone. He's just mm -hmm. lazy. He's lazy because <laughs> he doesn't spend the time that Chris Rock does honing new material. Right. He's a great writer. He's underrated as a writer. And mm -hmm. when he does put pen to paper and tr try new stand up, it's mm -hmm. sensational. So. Yeah. Yeah, I got to see him a couple times when I was living in LA at the store, and he was just, he fucking crushed every time. And he's very humble about it. Very humble about it, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it was funny, I got a Bob, so I only met Bob Saget once. He was super, super nice, but I was, wasn't even doing stand-up yet, but I went to see um, Spamalot within, like, the first week it was open, right? So mm -hmm. it was all the original cast. And of course, there were a lot of celebrities that were sitting in the audience. Catherine O'Hara was there and whatever. But I went to go get drinks for me and my girlfriend. And Bob Saget was like, it was in the, during the intermission or whatever. And he was just there. I literally bumped into him. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. But I had my Spamalot, um, you know, pamphlet or whatever, the the uh, mm -hmm. whatever it's called. I can't think of it. Uh, in my hand. <laughs> and he was like, and I guess he was like a little drunk at the time. Or whatever. But he's like, oh, no, no, don't worry about it, dude. And he grabbed my thing and signed it. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got a spam a lot thing with Bob Saget's name, which is hilarious because then when I went to get like we got to meet every like um you know uh David Hyde Pierce mm -hmm. and Hank Azaria back then. Hank Azaria had the pamphlet and he looked on it and he went, Bob Saget. Like, like he had no but he was also doing that thing where he was almost like, is he in the show? And I just didn't know it. That's awesome. Yeah, that was pretty great. <laughs> but, uh, signed or whatever, but yeah, that was it. He seems like a really cool dude. Very cool. Yeah, so you so you're doing the road. What 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 when? How was the what was your first writing gig? Do you remember? I sure do. It was this uh, short-lived morning show on ABC called the Mike and Maddie Show. I don't know if you remember it. They combined no. super clean-cut white bread cruise ship comic named mm -hmm. Michael Berger. They combined him with a Cuban American from Miami named Maddie Monfort. And oh, wow! Okay, Maddie was not funny. Um, <laughs> Michael Berger. You know, he was funny in the cruise ship kind of way. Mm -hmm. um, 
So they combined them. They were trying to compete with sort of Regis and Kathy Lee or that template. So okay. The nationally syndicated show. And I was hired. Um, I, I stayed there six months and literally had a meeting with Lauren Michaels while I had that job. He wow. hired me and I came back to the office and said, hey, guess what? Friday's my last day. I got Saturday Night Live. <laughs> so I went from that show to SNL and the sweet revenge that I got on them, John, John although it came back to haunt me because they were pissed, was I wrote a Hollywood Minute joke for Spade. Oh, nice. Which was um, George Hamilton and his wife, Alana, have been given a morning talk show called The George and Alana Show. Uh, the network says that this is geared to the um, 11 people who watch Mike and Maddie. <laughs> so that's a classic Hugh Fink structured joke. Oh, beautiful. You got, got a huge laugh on Saturday Night Live. And then it got back to me that the producers of Mike and Maddie, and especially Maddie Monfort, the host, mm -hmm. was really pissed at me. Wow. And they're like, he's not loyal. How dare he? Oh, my God. So there you go. Go. Yeah, that's brutal. Go. <laughs> oh my god were you there for the whole thing where uh the eddie murphy thing with it like not, he... not only was i there the joke i just quoted you that was the episode oh no way way oh and that's so I can, great i can tell you this that of all the jokes like yes that eddie murphy joke got a huge response in the studio meaning mm -hmm. the of boost but there were other jokes that i wrote for that night that also got like so the one I remember was um, Tony Randall got married this weekend to actress Heather Harlan. Mm -hmm. Although friends don't expect the marriage to last because she's 34 and he's gay. <laughs> and uh, even Lauren Michaels was mad at me and said, how do you feel outing an old man? And I'm like, Lauren, I'm not saying he's gay. That's your projection on it. <laughs> um, he's married to a woman so right. it's not for me to say that he's gay right right but so that's, that's the eddie murphy joke you're referring to was slipped into that hollywood minute it was probably like the fourth or fifth joke of mm -hmm. that segment wow but i think it might be my favorite hollywood minute segment and, and not because of the eddie murphy joke just mm -hmm. because i think pound for pound the jokes in that particular night were all super hard hitting. Yeah. Really funny. And I watched it recently and I'm like, wow, that was a great night of comedy. Yeah. You know, it's funny. That's what I do remember from that. Like, I don't remember each joke, but I do remember that whole fucking set being on fire. It was. And it was, by the way, it was the Christmas show. So it was the last show of the year. Oh my God. So Fade, he, he, I don't even know if he had done Hollywood minute that entire half a year. It may have been mm. like, you're the only one we did between, you know, September and December. Right. And he left the show a few months later. So that was his final Hollywood Minute as a cast member. Wow. That's and I incredible. Was to be his main writer. And I watched it recently. I'd say I wrote 70, 75% of those jokes. That's incredible, man. Yeah. Fade wrote some genius ones, but, mm -hmm. you know, I was his writer. He brought me onto the show and, yeah, we entrusted me, and um, he'd approve all the jokes, of course. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, they were really, really hard hitting. <laughs> so you, do you, did you hook up with Spade before Saturday Night Live? Yeah. Oh, well, cool. Exactly about my stand-up crew. So he and I became friends at the Melrose Improv. Oh, cool. Yeah, he moved out from Phoenix. He had a lot of heat. They said he was like this short blonde comic who looked like he was sixteen years old, and uh, <laughs> we immediately hit it off because we had sort of disdain for celebrities and Hollywood. Yeah. And so, yeah. Yeah, we got this picture. Yeah, this is on his show, though, I believe. Yeah, right here. no, no, that was my show. Well, it was your show, okay. It's the show that I created for him. Oh, so nice. That's from the press junket of Showbiz Show with David Spade. So Fantastic. I'm a sole creator and an executive producer, and then he came aboard as, a, as an executive producer and host. That's fantastic. Yeah, that was a great show too, man. Thank you. We I were ahead of our time, time, right? Yeah, absolutely. I had it. Yeah, absolutely, man. Because that was like I, I kind of missed him being on SNL because I used to watch it then all the time. I was, you know, uh, a huge fan of SNL back then, and uh, I mean, I am now too. But you know what I mean? It changed. I yeah, everybody's got their generation of of SNL, so that was right. mine. 
And you know, that show we did, John, was before TMZ, before yeah. the internet. So that's what made it ahead of its time is we were doing topical takedowns of the hypocrisy and mediocrity of Hollywood. Yeah, and you just which I thought it would, I was gonna say, I thought it was a good combination too because it was The Daily Show. You had Jon Stewart doing his thing or whatever. And then it was a nice like other side of that whole thing still still hitting the still hitting the news, but just entertainment news. It was a perfect and balance. Right. We stayed away from politics. Yeah. And just did entertainment news. Yeah, it was fucking, I, I loved it, man. It was a great block. Thanks. And I like his, show. honestly, I feel like his new show that um, Lights Out was, yeah. I feel like they fucking pulled that thing too soon. A lot of people feel that way. I think that, look, Comedy Central barely exists as a network anymore. Yeah, it's the South Park channel now. It's the South Park channel. Yeah, I mean, I can't, I, honestly, like, I'll sometimes I'll just leave it on and I'll go back to it like a couple hours later and <laughs> fucking South Park's still on. I'm like, how is this possible? Exactly. Yeah. But um, that's awesome that you guys wound up doing that kind of thing. What was the audition? I mean, so you, when you came on SNL, because it sounded like you you just had a meeting with Lauren Michaels as opposed to so now here's where I, they make you audition. Right. So David introduced me to Lauren, I'm going to mm -hmm. say a year or two before I actually got the job. Okay. And it, was more, it was more of a social encounter, but mm -hmm. it went well. And Lauren had been told by Spade that, um, you know, I was funny and wrote mm -hmm. stuff for him. And then when the show cleaned house in 95, they mm -hmm. hired nine new writers and five or six new cast members, including Will Ferrell, mm -hmm. and Cherry O'Terry. Mm -hmm. And Spade had been really nice to keep bringing me up. That's cool. And so then Lauren said, well, David, how would you like to have your own segment on the show? Nice. So Dick Spade said, Hugh, come up with a segment for me. So I came up with Spade in America. Oh, nice. Yeah. So every week, you know, David had his own spot. It usually came right before, or right after Weekend Update. Mm -hmm. And we weren't limited to him staying at a desk. We would go out. We went to the World Series. We went nice. to um, Sean Penn gave him a tattoo at a Hell's yes. Angel bar, right? All that stuff. Yeah. I remember that. That was so fucking cool. Yeah. Uh, is it, it was it like kind of intimidating, like being in the presence of, cause everybody's got their different Lauren stories. Yeah. No, no. I mean, of course I worked for Lauren for seven years and he was mm -hmm. in some ways I'd say, you know, we were friendly and, um, I have so much respect for him at times he was intimidating, but at times me being a professional and a comedian and a writer, I would, you know, get into arguments with him and stick up for myself, which I think mm -hmm. he likes, he appreciates. Yeah. Um, but talk about intimidation. When I met Sean Penn, he came, he showed up to that biker bar slightly drunk, wearing <laughs> like an Armani suit. Uh -huh. I go, this is the coolest guy in the planet. Right. He just exuded stardom. Wow. And I remember going, that's a quality that I haven't seen a lot. So he gave he gave Spade his tattoo drunk. Drunk. And by the way, he did a good job. He is a yeah. good, he's a good tattoo, but that's what's amazing. Spade was like, Sean, are you fucking drunk? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's fucking wild, man. Yeah. Um, I got to ask you about, um, I mean, I'm, I still want to talk about SNL and stuff too, but this is like huge for me. I am a, uh, I'm a huge, huge Muppet fan. Um, and this is, I saw this online, man. How were, how, what, what, explain this photo to me and also just, you know, your experience there. Sure. So the photo I can explain to you is that, at the end of the shoot of the NBC movie that I co-wrote mm -hmm. called um, uh, A Muppet's, it was called Letters to Santa, A Muppet's Christmas. I remember that. We became friendly with the Muppeteers mm -hmm. and they were really nice and they said, oh, Hugh, we know you have a couple little kids at home. You got to get a picture with us. Very so the cool. photo you just showed was, the, and they take their Muppeteering very seriously. Mm -hmm. They all gathered around me and that was the photo. It was like our rap rap photo from the set. That is so fucking cool. Really cool. And then I became friendly with them. A year later, I produced D.L. Hughley's show on CNN. Mm -hmm. called, you know, D.L. Hughley breaks the news. And the Muppet guy who does Kermit and the guy who does Gonzo, they came to a taping of the D.L. show in New York. Oh, no way. Yeah. That's did. so cool. It was Steve, it's Steve Whitmere, right? That's correct. Very good. And, um, you Dave Gold. Thank you. And Dave mm -hmm. Gold. 
That's right. That's exactly right. That's wow. awesome. You know your Muppets. Oh, dude, so, I know all my. I, I'm like, I'm like half nerd net right now too. Was, we you a stroll. Stroll. Gold, when you, when you was, by the way. What's that? What did you say? Oh, I said Goltz and Whitmer were friends. Oh, so that's awesome. Like, like they came together. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, were you still around when Frank Oz was around or no? What do you no, I was part of Frank Oz, but you know, Bill Beretta was the force mm -hmm. of nature. So I gave Pepe the Prawn a huge part um, in the movie. In fact, I'd say in this, my script, he may get the biggest laughs. Oh, yeah. He's he's fucking hilarious. I, lo I love that, that, that they started including him more and stuff, too, because he's really a really funny character. But the, the greatest experience from doing that movie, John, was mm -hmm. I got to work and meet with Uma Thurman. Oh, no way. Oh, that's right. Yes. yes. He had young kids, and apparently she they reached out to her. Agents heard that, like, Uma, you don't want to do a Muppets movie, do you? And she's like, actually, my kids are saying I have to. <laughs> so the greatest thing was I had to go to her apartment on Fifth Avenue in New York City, mm -hmm. and it was allegedly for her to just talk to me as the writer. Well, when I show up, she had a super strong agenda. Wow. Which is, Okay, hey, you're the writer. Here's the part I want you to write for me more. Write for me. There was no negotiation. Wow. So I've really not been in that position. Of course, I had come from SNL where I'm used to controlling my own sketches, mm -hmm. telling the actors what to do. But look right. at the German. So I just was like, yeah, okay, Emma, I'll do that. And so That's I wrote, wrote the part, and I made it work. And mm -hmm. she actually was, I think she comes off really well. Yeah, she she's great in that too. That's awesome. I had no idea that like that I, I, anybody would like demand something like that of a kid's. You know? like, it shows me how like Hollywood stars that they're clearly used to that, and it's also showed me how they treat writers. Like yeah, you know. yeah. I felt like that impression. Like I, I've written for a couple of things before too, where like they either don't look at you or don't acknowledge your existence, and it's kind of weird to ha also know that you have the fate of their show in your hands, but they also still treat you like shit. So you're like, that's right. Yeah. It's a weird balance. Your credit for us, she had no problem with any of the jokes that I wrote for her. Oh, so that's cool. Once I signed off on the character, she sort of wanted to play. Right. He was actually good with the dialogue. So it was fine. I feel like for the most of the like 90, like, I don't know, mid nineties into the two thousands, SNL had some really good, you know, guest hosts, you know what I mean? Like it was classic guest hosts. Was there anybody there that was like particularly like, rubbed you the wrong way? Yes, there were. Um, well, the most infamous memory I have is Bill Pullman. Really? Yeah. Because he had come off, you know, his one big credit, John, which was Independence, Independence Day. Day. But he thought he was hot shit. So the, I wrote him a monologue cause I wrote more monologues than any writer maybe in the history of the show, but certainly during that era. Because wow. coming from stand-up, I was really good. At, you know. So the monologue I wrote him, which is a classic SNL template, was taking questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. And all the questions were basically confusing him with Bill Paxton. <laughs> <laughs> and it killed at the table read. Right. Lauren picked it, and Pullman was seem fine with it. Mm -hmm. Then a day before the show... I'm told, um, yeah, Pullman wants to meet you in his dressing room. He apparently wants to change the monologue. So, of course, I rolled my eyes, and I knew what was coming. Yeah. So I walk, and he goes, hey, man, so what are we doing here? And I go, we're doing a comedy show? Right. Um, and he's like, no, man, don't be a used car salesman. That's bullshit. Why, wow. why are we doing this monologue, man? I mean, it doesn't work. Because people know who I am. And of course, what I'm going to say to them, no, they don't know who you are. Oh, my God. So I have to gently tell them, look, Bill, the best thing you can do on this show is make fun of yourself. Yeah. Not, and if you make fun of yourself, even if it's not true that people do know who you are, but you pretend they don't, mm -hmm. you're going to score. Everyone's going to love you. And he wouldn't back down. And you can tell you that like, the publicists were getting in his ear. Right. Saying, you're bigger than that, man. You're a star. And then Not the greatest much. thing was, then I had to go to Lord Michaels, my boss, and say, he's refusing to do the monologue. And I explained mm -hmm. why. And Lauren was so cool. He goes, I had dinner with him last night. We took a walk back from the restaurant to 30 Rock. Do you know how many people recognized him? I said, no. He goes, Not a fucking one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. But the bottom line is, he refused to do my monologue, and instead he did this 
piece of shit, half a monologue. It was like barely 60 seconds. Wow. It was nothing because at that point, the, we're basically, okay, okay, dude, you just passed on a great monologue. So we're not going to even waste time on the show coming up with something else. That's fucking nuts, man. What a bummer. I would not see that. That kind of, I love Bill Pullman just because, you know, independent. I mean, I don't know him from anything else. I mean, he's, he's doing really good in, in that new show, The Sinner. Yeah. But before Independence Day, man, I would just like, that was it. He was the fucking president from Independence Day. And, and, the, and the dude, right away, like, I ran into, the, in typical Hollywood way, I ran into him at a party a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And I made a point to go up to him. Nice. And he was nothing but friendly. And clearly, oh. he didn't have, if he did have bad memories of me or the experience, he didn't show it. Right. So it's, you know, I bet you any amount of money, you were probably right. It was just his fucking agents and publicists, you know, getting in his head. That's, you, you would think by now that those dudes would just understand that the more you make fun of yourself and, and don't take yourself too seriously, the better you're going to fucking look. They still don't get it. Yeah. That's wild. I've heard a couple stories about um, uh, like uh, Steven Seagal and um, like those guys, like people just getting banned for shit. Right. I mean, Seagal was before my time, but mm -hmm. he was a legendary bad host. Yeah. And, and again, uh, you would think they would just know, but it, it's insane. Garth Brooks hosted twice when I was there. The first time he killed and was great because no one expect Garth Brooks to be funny or anything. Right. Second time, though, he comes. So now, you know, he thinks he's a comedy expert. So <laughs> I wrote a monologue that, again, everyone loved, killed at the mm -hmm. table. And the joke was, John, how Garth talks about himself in third person in interviews. So I had him come up and go, hey, it's great to be here on Saturday Night Live. Garth loves Saturday Night Live. You know, let me tell you what Garth did yesterday. Garth was in New York. So the whole thing was that. So yeah. He didn't like it. He he, because it clearly rubbed him the wrong way. Mm -hmm. He said to me, he "Goes, hey man, if it's okay with you, I just want to do a monologue promoting the charity I do for for my for kids." Oh, Jesus! And I go, "Yeah, that's not a monologue, right? The comedy show. People want you to come out and be funny." Yeah, but he's Garth Brooks. He didn't care. Wow. That's fucking all right. Has there ever been a situation where like Lauren has like stepped in and been like, yeah, you got to fucking do what the writers say. There's n in my experience, Lauren's very brilliant at, he doesn't want the host to think that he's twisting their arm. He wants it to come from the writers. So like he'll say, Hugh, you got to work it. Right. But he has a way of planting seeds. Like he'll say to the host, they'll say, yeah, Lauren, I don't want to do that sketch. And Lauren will go, Right. So you're very tired. I know it's a long day and you know, it takes, it takes it out of you. You'll feel better about this in the morning. Trust me. Oh, that's brilliant. So that, sort of get in their head. Mm -hmm. But the one story I did hear uh, from a writer who was there at the time was when Travolta hosted before I was there, the only oh. time he hosted SNL, there was a sketch that they wanted him to do. Mm -hmm. And it's Saturday night. It's between dress rehearsal and air and Travolta wanted to cut the sketch. And Lauren was adamant that he didn't want the sketch cut and that John should do it. Mm -hmm. And Travolta goes, hey, you know what? I got a private plane in Teterboro, okay? I can leave, I can leave right now. You would have a fucking host. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That's a great impression, too. Leave the show and fly out on his jet. Right. That's fucking wild. Do you have a favorite host? It's sort of... Like this, I have so many great memories of certain, like Samuel L. Jackson oh. was amazing. Yeah, he's the best. Um, believe it, Kevin Spacey was fantastic. Oh yeah, he's he's, but he can do so much. I mean, obviously, in so spite much. of it, but like he's like wildly talented. He's wildly talented. Um, Jennifer Aniston's great. You know, she's a really good sketch player. Yeah, I heard she was supposed to be in a cast member. Like Adam Sandler and those dudes wanted her to come on. That's right. That's a good. Yeah. That's right. Um. Those come to mind um, as, you know, amazing hosts. Mm. Is there anybody that's been your, do you, do you still watch the show every now and again? I do. Is there anybody that you've seen that, cause I feel like there's a lot of people that'll go, like Scarlett Johansson's one of those people who's hosted a bunch and I feel like she's willing to do anything, even though, you know what I mean? Like it's yeah. you know, Colin. She's a, she's a gamer. You know, I was yeah. with John and I, I, you'll have to tell me his name. It's the guy from Bridge, Bridgerton. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, fuck. 
I'm yeah. blanking on his name, but I know exactly what you're talking about. He was really good. He was. Yeah, he was phenomenal. He was um, at that time. Yeah, he's young, right? He's young. Absolutely. Yeah, it's Sh Timothy Chalamet. Timothy. Oh, no, no. No. Not Chalamet. No. Chalamet's a movie star. Bridgerton's that TV series that's kind of sexy about early 20th century England. Right, right. And this guy is is like a British black guy. I believe. Oh, it's um. Oh, dude, yes, I did see that episode. Yeah. I cannot. I'm. I'll find his name in a second. But yeah, he was phenomenal. Right. I, you know what? He almost had vibes of like. I w I wanted to be like. Did he ever try stand up? No. He he had such natural timing. He didn't. A lot of these actors try too hard. They they go mm -hmm. car cartoonish. He played things real, but he was really good. Right. How do you feel about the like Elon Musk one? Did you did you get pissed that they had him on? Or? Yeah, it, it, it kind of pissed me off. I mean, I thought that yeah. show was bad. It was. It was a fucking. It was it's a bomb. It was a bomb. Right. Yeah. It's, you know. Who, you know who was good was um the chick from Queen's Gambit. She was phenomenal. See? So good. I can't think of her name either, and I feel and bad. I didn't but. think. I didn't. I thought that she was better than the writing that show. Yeah. But sort of everything she was in, she sort of was likable mm -hmm. and funny enough. Like, it's not that I thought she was a comic genius, but I thought that she carried herself very well. Right. If there was like a tip, like, I feel like the the whole show rides on the host just trusting the writers. Because I've heard like different stories where they're like, hey, if they come in and they're like, what do you, what do you guys want to do? Then it's like... A, a awesome because the writers don't ever want to make the host look like an idiot right they never want to make those look like an idiot and the other thing i'll tell you is if the writing step if the writers are good mm -hmm. then a host or cast members will take what writers do and make it great right but unfortunately if the writing isn't good it's pretty hard for people to sort of make it good mm -hmm. they can make it passable yeah, but that's why I say writing is so important because if you don't have good writing, it doesn't matter how talented the cast is. Right. What do you What do you make of like? There's, a, I mean, there's so much. I feel like a lot of, um, you know, stand up sometimes. Now, I mean, it's always great when stand ups are getting any of attention. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like to to a fault, we don't even care what the attention is necessarily as long as we're getting, you know. Right. I mean, I'm with you on that. You know, I don't my stand-up career didn't come from the background of um, being able to promote myself mm -hmm. on Instagram and all that. Yeah. But I feel like there's definitely a confusion over stand-ups who are really good and mm -hmm. are really good writers and take their craft seriously, as opposed to spending more time successfully promoting themselves yeah. through social media. So yeah, I don't really care for it. And yet, it's like, well, I guess it's a good business decision, good business decision on their part because it works. It, uh, it it does, and it's really fucking. It it's conflicting too because I feel like you know some of the stuff is really interesting. Like I always like to hear stand ups uh, who know other people and who know other comics or whatever. Sometimes controversy is a little fun, but then like after a while, when it, when I catch these clips online and I feel like you know, they start talking trash about another comic who talked trash about them. You almost have to go to find that video and their pocket, you know? So right. it's like, it's all reaction videos after a while. And then I realize I'm just making them money. You know, it, what's the difference between that and like a fucking soap opera or TMZ? Oh, yeah, or like championship wrestling, right? <laughs> yes. This theater of promotion and a little war. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's pretty brilliant sometimes that after a while I'm like, I haven't laughed once. Exactly. <laughs> like, what the fuck? Right. Um, yeah, because there's a lot of shit going on about, like, they, they, you know, they talk shit about SNL at this point where they're, by, like, the writers get desperate and steal and shit like that. And I don't know what it's like now, but, like... Yeah, I mean, you know, I've always heard that that wasn't... I don't recall during my tenure maybe one time someone got accused, but not generally, but that does seem to be happening more and more. Look, more as, and more. as a TV writer, I found that clever minds think alike. Mm -hmm. so sometimes... Just because a premise is similar doesn't mean someone stole it. Right. It's a lot of parallel thinking. A lot of parallel thinking. That's different than, you know, Carlos Mencia getting up and doing word for word bits of Louis C.K. or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That was that was egregious. That was like Perfect I don't know how we got away with it for so fucking long because it was like 
you know, George, like the shit he stole from George Lopez was like literally mo like word for word monologues, right. you know? Right. Um, it was, it was, that was fucking wild. Yeah. Uh, I was reading a couple other things about you too. You got to open for John Stewart at Carnegie Hall. That, and you know, John, I'm a classical violinist. I played pretty yes. well. Yes. I was so just going to get it. For me to get to go to Carnegie Hall, not mm -hmm. to stand up to a sold out crowd, but to get to play my violin to an audience in Carnegie Hall, I'll never top that. It was incredible. I was going to ask how the hell did that even, because I mean, you know, you've been doing stand up for a while or whatever. You got to open for John. Did you know him as a stand up first? I, I knew him a little and he knew me, knew me a little and we respected mm -hmm. each other. We weren't friends, but I give all the credit to John and his manager to this day, Jim Dixon, because mm -hmm. Jim apparently was trying to help John pick the perfect opening act for his Carnegie Hall gig. And he goes, yeah, I think Hugh Fink would be great. And John, wow. that's a really good idea. So wow. they reached out to me and Alan King hosted the show, you know, yeah. Legend. so he did so the good. time, then he brought me on and then he brought John on. And um, John was very appreciative of how much a high I would be on by getting to play my violin at trying to, like John's like, Hugh, that's amazing. So then when John came out after my set, his opening joke to the crowd was, what a shithole. <laughs> Oh, that's phenomenal. Yeah, I thought that was so fucking cool, man. I mean, I, I love that you're a classical violinist, too, because I like that. I always like when when comedians have a facet of other talents that no one knows about. Yeah, it's cool. And, and yeah. What was the, you know, when you were doing the classical violin thing, did the comedy like come first or was it just like how did that how did you choose between this is what I want to do professionally and so, this is there was a t brief time in my teen years where I love the violin and fantasized about being a great classical violinist. But mm -hmm. the truth is I was realistic and I heard some like young Korean kids who could play circles around me. And I go, this ain't happening. Like right. I can practice eight hours a day. I'm never going to be as good. Right. As and I'm sure there were no Korean standups at the time. So it's not like you could have heard one, you know? <laughs> exactly. So yeah. that was my decision pretty easy. I didn't just want to be, a mediocre professional violinist. If I did it, I wanted to be a great soloist and right. knew my own limitations. So I can, I still love the violin. I still play it, but that's when I go, Hey, there's nothing to stop me from using violin in my act. Yeah. And so I think I did it in a way that was very clever, but there was a point in my career where some really good comedians um, who, who said, Hugh, you should not be to be, you don't want to be defined by your violin. Like you, you have more to offer. You're a witty person. Right. So if you want to really make strides as a stand up, you got to stop using the violin. So that was a big deal yeah. to stop using it, but it did force me to write stuff and not rely on it. Cause initially I didn't want to be known as a prop act. Right. You know, people go, Oh, Hugh Fink, the funny guy with the violin, but that's a dangerous way to be known because that can really limit how people perceive you. Yeah. Yeah. I could, um, I'm <clears throat> like, I've done, I can do impressions of people like, but not like, you know, but for the most part or whatever. Right. But I never use that. People would always be like, Hey, how come you didn't do any of that in your act? I'm like, well, cause I, my brain doesn't think around impressions. And I never wanted to be one of those dudes who was like, I had a dream last night where Homer Simpson and you know, whatever. But it is one of those things. Like I, I feel what you mean. Like I just didn't want to be known as the guy who did any of that kind of stuff. And I like coming you up. You might know. That. Cause you seem to be tapped into the stand these days. There's that really young comic who who does a lot of impressions. When I say young, he's like out of high school. Oh. So he's gotten some attention because he'll do rap. You probably know who I mean. I know you're talking about. You know, I watch him and I go, look, he's okay. Mm -hmm. But he ain't Daryl Hammond. Right. He's not. He's certainly not Frank Caliendo. It's mm. like you can't just do decent voices. Right. There's got to be sort of an innate comedy soul to who you are. Mm -hmm. Sort of take the voices and add humor to them. Yeah. And I, my impression of this impressionist is that he's got a ways to go to sort of find the organic comedic perspective to his mm -hmm. voices. Yeah, it's weird. That's another thing, too, with the social media, man. If you, I feel like that underdevelops comedians sometimes, too, because if you just get a following for, first of all, if you get a, any, a following for any one particular thing, 
that no matter what you get, if you get six to 10,000 people following you, they want to see that fucking thing over and over and over and over and over again. So that makes you parent and want to produce the same homogenous kind of crap. So I feel like that's the same way. If somebody gets famous for doing voices, they don't have to grow unless they force themselves to do it. It's true. Yeah. It's, it's weird as shit. Um, do you, how often would you say you got back up to do stand up? So obviously the pandemic, I hadn't been on stage in over a year, but then right. got a great gig in San, San Antonio, Texas, oh, where I nice. opened for a, a jazz band at like a 700 audience theater. Right. Wonderful. So I'll go months without setting foot on stage and then I'll do five sets in one week. Nice. And, and I, I'm going to Israel in a few weeks to do a comedy tour of Israel. That's fantastic. Wow. Never been. Um, it's going to be amazing. I'm doing six different shows in different cities in Israel. That's incredible, man. Do you, t- so what, what's your act? Act is different than when you would do, let's say San Antonio. That's a good question. <laughs> yes. Because honestly, I did like one joke about myself being Jewish in San Antonio. I will do all my Jewish material. <laughs> I feel like it'll go over well over there. It'll go over well, yeah. And um, they want me to be, they said, do your greatest hits in Israel because the audience is Americans who are now living in Israel. And okay. I guess they're fairly conservative. So mm-hmm. it's probably not a time for me to do a lot of risky stuff. But right. me, of course, once I'm in Israel, I'm going to make observations and I'm going to be compelled to comment on stuff I see. Also, yeah, and also kudos to you, though, because I feel like now's a weird time to go to Israel. Believe it or not, John, I was supposed to go in June mm-hmm. and it got postponed because of the violence. Holy shit. Oh, yeah, yeah no. June, June would have been. <laughs> I, I would have been there. Yeah, yeah. So it, I didn't know if it was going to be rescheduled for months or a year, but they rescheduled it for August. But of course, now. With the pandemic, every day the news changing, it's still mm-hmm. weird because Israel is one of the first countries that saw the effects of the Delta variant on people. Yeah. So I, at this point, I don't know what to expect, but I'm as of now, I'm going. Yeah, good. No, that's fucking awesome, dude. Well, I, I feel like I, I same thing. Like I'm just, I keep hearing shit about the Delta variant all over the place. Obviously, vaccinized and and all that other shit too. Yeah. But like. Now I'm just holding strong that the dates I've got booked to go back. I'm going to Houston in September. Right. Uh, I'll go back out to LA eventually. I think during sometime in the fall, but I got a bunch of other dates coming up. I'm like, I hope these clubs don't fucking panic. Seriously. And- My other hope, John, is that all the people who refuse to get vaccinated, who are going to vote for Republicans in the midterm election, mm-hmm. I hope they die. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was right there. I'm like, say it. Between now. Yeah. I'm saying it. You don't have to. So that way, the Democrats win the midterm elections. These bastards don't vote. Yeah. And we don't have to worry about uh, them spreading COVID because they're no longer around. Yeah. You know what's, you know what's fucked up, man? One of the true joys I've had over this pandemic is any time in the news that somebody who is anti-vax or, or anti-mask or, you know, COVID deniers drops dead, I just screenshot their fucking photo and the news article, and then I pick a song. A new song each time to go with the death. And it's just pure joy on my end. It's joyful. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Fuck them. Because it's, it's, I don't understand. Like, it's just, I'm so tired of being dragged back out into society by fucking morons. When we don't John, has anyone work. done this bit? I just thought of this today, actually. So I'll run it by you. I want to do a bit about, um, yeah, you know, uh, the polio during, you know, the 1930s was, um, you know, rampant and killing people. But what you don't know is there there were people who were like, uh, they go, uh, hey, I'm young and healthy. Do I really need this polio vaccine? <laughs> like, it just seems to me to be, you know, I I recover. I don't have any problem with it. Because that's how I hear these people. I never heard of 30% of Americans refusing the fucking polio vaccine. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Right. right. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's so fucking true, man. It's outrageous. Yeah. It's so insane when you think about, like, especially when you see news articles from back in the day where we haven't even developed, like, where they, you're like, what did we do, you know, fucking years ago? And they're like, wear a mask and don't go outside. And you're like, okay. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> right. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, wow, we really haven't come that far with medicine, have we? We just limited the amount of people that can get it. Oh, yeah, it's it's fucking torturous. Um, <laughs> I mean, when during the pandemic, when you were sitting, like, what did you do to keep sane? Because this is what I did. I, yeah, I that's, just, oh, that's great. It, I did a lot of, um, and I continue to do a lot of freelance writing gigs, not necessarily television stuff, mm -hmm. but um, corporations that nice. were doing stuff online and um you know things that could i could do from home right I created so a you, whole sort of side business of that did you get into the zoom shit very much so with my buddy david keckner oh fuck, dude i love david so keckner I, I don't know him I, i've never met him but he's he's the greatest guy so we collaborate a lot in fact uh, as you and i speak right now mm -hmm. i wrote a online thing he's doing for a major bank oh nice yeah and so like it's it's kind of amazing. He'll do it in front of a green screen at home, mm -hmm. so he can go into Todd Packer, right? Do his Todd Packer character, or he'll uh, do Champ Kind from yeah. Anchorman. Yeah. So that's been really cool. And then the other side hustle I've had during the pandemic that I wanted to mention on your show was um, mm -hmm. teaching TV sketch writing and how to write for late night. And I've done some really great workshops. Wow! Live on Zoom. Awesome, man. So I can have students all over the country. And if you go to hughfink.com, um, it tells you what the courses are. And um, I've really enjoyed it. Great. Well, absolutely. I'll plug that. I'll throw that up with the episode and everything, too. That's awesome, man. Great. Uh, how, are you, how are you liking the teaching thing, though? Do you find it like... I love it. I got to tell you, I really like teaching. I think I'm good at it. And mm -hmm. I feel that to give people who are you know young professionals... Mm -hmm. the opportunity to learn from someone like me. So they're not taking a class with some hack who's never done it. Dude, or, yeah. Right. So, and I'm happy to share my knowledge and I touch it. The, like I have an advanced class where I'll be appropriately tough. Right. Um, you know, they send me something. I'll go, look, if you want to get to the next level, you have to get better. You can't have this premise. Like that's not going to fly. Right. These type of jokes. And I think they're really appreciated. My methodology is not just me get talking, but I take classic sketches, some mm -hmm. which I wrote, some which are just, I love from SNL, Chappelle Show, Key and Peele, and I show them as teaching tools, but then I deconstruct and analyze the writing. That's incredible, man. I wish I had that. Cause like I, when I first started writing for other, first I started writing for other comedians and then uh, you know how that is. So, yeah. you know, you gotta do quick to whatever. And then I started writing for like, you know, um, the VH1, I love the 90s, whatever, where they, you're still not in a writer's room, but they send you packets. So you're still by yourself. So the first time I actually wrote with other people, it was like a, it was like a whole different thing. And I wish I had, I'd had, I mean, I like learning on the fly, but you know, the pressure builds when you're just, you know, when you're learning it as you go or whatever, but it is, it was a completely different format to write that kind of shit by yourself. It's for really other people. Yourself, right. And so you need to get some professional guidance on, am I, I'm on the right track? Yes. And I think this is helpful to people. That's fantastic, man. That's so cool. Um, I was going to ask you about the key and peel and the Chappelle show thing, because I know you had the unique opportunity to work with, you know, uh, both in that, in that way. Are you still there? Did you free? Oh, are you still there? Okay, here. I, I didn't know if you froze or not. Uh, <laughs> I sometimes, I I'm, I'm like, Oh, did I go away or did they? No, I hear um, uh, but, uh, but what did you, so I know there's been like, comparisons between the two. They are similar shows, but I feel like they're still completely different comedic I think, voices. I would say the difference is that when Chappelle acts in a sketch, mm -hmm. it's it's unmistakably Dave Chappelle. Right. And the stuff that wouldn't be nearly as funny if Chappelle weren't performing it. Uh, Whereas I fight with Key and Peele, they're great actors, but I feel mm -hmm. like the writing was so strong sometimes that, um, if you had capable actors, maybe it wouldn't be quite as good, mm -hmm. but the writing really is so strong that they work as sketches, period. Yeah, that was one of the best, I think, sketch shows I've seen, I mean, you know, I don't know how long. I didn't see one thing that I got exhausted by or tired of, which is funny because I feel like SNL is such a hit and miss thing. And it's sure, I'm sure it like, again, I have like this, uh, you know, crystallized image of the time I grew up with with SNL. So, you know, I don't know if I just, I'm getting to be one of those people who like when I watch it now where I'm like, this isn't what I remember. Um, you know, but yeah. uh, but I thought Key and Peel Man was just fucking they were just batting a, a thousand every time. Yeah, and you know, obviously it's a, 
it's a luxury to get to pre-tape your stuff and have weeks of, of time to rewrite mm -hmm. and do that, which they did. SNL, people forget, it's, it's, live. it's less than a week. You, yeah. you write the stuff on Tuesday, they pick it on Wednesday and the show's Saturday. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons the quality control is different. Right. In your opinion, I got to ask you this because you're the you're the first SNL guy that I've had on on the show. Okay. So who is your favorite? Who's your favorite? And then who do you think is the best weekend update? Norm Macdonald, hands down. Norm Macdonald. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Yeah. And I, and I happened to be blessed to be writing there when Norm was there, and um, because Norm and I were friendly as comics. Mm -hmm. most, when you're a when you're a staff sketch writer, you generally don't write for update. But they made an exception with me because I was friends with them. So oh, I nice. flip him joke sometime. Um, That's and, awesome. and, yeah. So Norm to me is the, was the best. And um, I think that Chevy was great. Mm -hmm. Chevy Chase was fantastic. Um, and then I guess I'd probably say Dennis Miller. Okay. Nice. Yeah. I like, I would go, you know what's weird? I, I guess if I had to pick a top, it would definitely be Norm. Norm's on the top of that. Yeah. Love Dennis Miller. I like I, I you know I've seen Chevy stuff in like reruns obviously or whatever but I love Kevin Nealon. Did you? So here's the thing. I just want to say Kevin's a brilliant stand-up, and mm -hmm. I think he's amazing. My issue with Kevin on Update was that he'd he'd I don't know if it was a problem of reading cue cards or whatever, but he'd mm. step on a lot of jokes. He did, and I always wondered if that was on purpose or if that was no, just. His I think I don't think he's that good an actor. I just think <laughs> that happened. Yeah, and okay. I don't know why, but I feel like it hurt jokes when wow. he was there. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I always wondered if that was like a just his spin on it. And he did it on purpose, or if that was a, a fuck up. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, that's awesome. And I also feel like I, I feel like Colin Quinn kind of got shafted just yeah. because you know. Well, like I mean, he wasn't great on Weekend Update, but he was also taking over his buddy's spot who gotten fired. Right. He did. So it. that's got a blow, right? It does. I think Colin is so funny, but he's a character, right? Like, yeah. you're never going to believe that Colin Quinn's a news anchor. But I thought, <laughs> in fairness to Colin, it was sort of a miscast. Uh, I, I agree, yeah. I, His voice being really gruff. Right. And, you know, Colin did that thing where he'd mumble asides after a joke didn't work or whatever. I know. Right. So, Which is what he's great at on Tough Crowd. On Tough Crowd. Right. Well, when Tough Crowd was on. Which I had the honor of being... So there's a tough crowd you can find on YouTube where I'm on with Nick DiPaolo. Yep. I just watched that one. And Geraldo, and it's great. And I hadn't seen it in years, but I was quite pleased to see that I was like this um, warrior in hiding. So, like, <laughs> they kept – DiPaolo kept making jokes about me be, being a Jewish elitist, and it would get a mm -hmm. laugh. But then I sort of was crouching tiger. As the show went on, I would come at him hard about being sort of a – a, a stupid, uneducated Italian. Yep. And we saw that. It was really funny, and it got huge laughs. Yeah, man. I fucking loved it. Because I, I was looking up some of your stuff afterward, and I was I was pumped to see you were on Tough Crowd, because I watched that show throughout high school, too, and I loved yeah. it. And that episode was great, man, because it was like you were slowly winding up to it and then just Boom. fucking pounding it out. Yeah, it was beautiful. I remember, I remember Collins like, don't mess with Fink. He's the meanest <laughs> guy in the show. I loved it. Yeah, man, it was so fucking great. But that doesn't happen often. Not a lot of those. Not a lot of those guest comics bested the ones that were on there all the time. That's right. That's right. Yeah, but that's pretty great. He's another one too. Like I, this is why I love comedy because I, I, I worked with uh, Nick DiPaolo a couple times, and we couldn't be opposites, po more polar opposites, you know, politically, right? Yeah. Man, funny is fucking funny. Oh, he's brilliant, he is brilliant, hilarious. Funny. He has one of my favorite inappropriate jokes from the '90s where he goes. Hey, you know, there's that, there's that uh, campaign on New York subways about uh, domestic violence. It says every nine seconds a woman in, in New York gets hit by a man. He goes, what they don't tell you is that every three seconds that same guy is being fucking nagged to death. <laughs> now, that joke is so funny. But yeah. I am doing that now. Oh, yeah. Dude, I can't even say who this was. I was, doing, I was in a meeting um, pitching a show that I had written or whatever, and it was – I. I won't even say who the hell it was, but anyway, so, the, so this guy I'm sitting because I think he still probably could do something for me, but I, but, I, um, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm sitting across, we're doing this whole thing. Right. And Nick was supposed to have a special come out 
Um, and, you know, I don't even know how we got on this topic of conversation because I think this guy was like friends with Nick or whatever. And it was filmed in Boston and uh, some woman started heckling him. So Nick went after her. And uh, it wound up, of course, you know, in the paper. It was like five, six years ago or whatever, but it wound up in the paper or whatever. And uh, so the guy who was like in charge of putting out a special was like, you need to apologize. And Nick was like, I'm not fucking apologizing. Oh, no. And because Nick wouldn't apologize, he fucking pulled his special. And wow. I, he was like really proud of it. And then I was like, I don't think I want to work with this guy anymore. Like, I was like, that's fucked up. Was it a TV special? Yeah. Wow. Uh, Bill Burr's uh, company. I think it was all things comedy or whatever. Wound up putting it out. It was fantastic. It was great. Well, John, it was a great fucking special. You're the first um, uh, podcast I want to announce this on. That um, a ATC has signed me to do my own show. Oh, dude! Congratulations. That's Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. And um, it's very different than yours, but mine is basically uh, as the guy who's being called bullshit on Hollywood. Coming out on ATC. At ATC. I pitched uh, Bill Burr's company. Mm -hmm. and it's basically, John, since I've been calling bullshit on Hollywood for 20 years. Yes. The premise is um, Hugh Fink's Real Hollywood. Beautiful. So I'm going to take stuff from my career, mm -hmm. my personal life, as well as my memories of things I saw as a child that horrified me about show business, like Jack Carter doing oh. the single-handedly worst set of stand-up I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> on a Dick Clark variety show. Fantastic. Um, yes, or, or my experience tracking down, um, remember the newlywed game, the famous thing about Bob Eubank saying, where's the weirdest place you and your spouse ever made whoopee? Yeah. And the woman saying, um, I'd have to say in the ass. So <laughs> I, 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 with David Spade, our show, we traced, we, I, we hired a private detective and found the actual woman. Oh, my God. So just stories like that that are sort of unbelievably funny and crazy. I'll do I'll do that. And then I'll also um, have one guest on not comedians, but actors, directors, writers who I've worked with. Nice, man. That that sounds fucking awesome, dude. Thank I can't you. wait to watch that. Thank you. Yeah. Congratulations, man. That's incredible. It'll be fun. And, and I think ATC is a great home for it. Don't you think? Absolutely. Yeah. That's going to be, I love ATC, man. They do so many good things for comedians, for comedy, for, good. you know, I mean, they're, they're just the best and I love that they're around and I'm glad it's, it's Bill Burr and Al Madrigal, right? That's that, right. That helm that, yeah. Bill and I are, are friendly colleagues, but Al I've known for longer and we're friendly. Oh. So yeah. So I talked to Al and he's like, that's hilarious. Why don't you pitch it to our team? Oh, beautiful. Al's a great guy too. I met him in, um, uh, when I was out at the comedy store in LA and he couldn't have been nicer. Just a, just a great, great dude. He's a great dude. Yeah, that's awesome, dude. I'm going to ask you one more question, then I'm going to let you go. You good? Okay, sure. Sweet. So if you had any piece of advice to give your younger self, something that you know now that could help you, what would it be? Oh, okay. Here it is. Mm -hmm. If you're working with someone who's a big star and super mm -hmm. successful, creatively, you can speak your opinion and up to a point, have a discussion with them about why you disagree maybe with the creative direction they're going. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, you have to back down and do what they want. Okay. Because it can get confusing sometimes when, you, when you're when you friends with someone like that. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, with stars, unfortunately, we're not equals. Like when they're a star and you're not a star, they're on a different level. Yep. And ultimately, yes, they want someone who they respect and who's creative and all that, but they also don't want to be arguing with someone creatively. Right. Absolutely. So that really, was, man. my advice is know when to hold them and when to fold them. And ultimately, if you want to keep a, rela a working professional relationship with that star, you have to give in. Beautiful. Thanks so much, dude. It was so great to get to know you, talk to you for a little bit. Thank you so much for coming on the show in the first place. I that loved was... it. I love you. I love your style. I love your bold questions. It was really fun. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate that. And I uh, wish you well on your new show. I cannot wait to see it. Thanks so much, John. Yep. Take care, man. Peace. Okay, bye. Bye. Dystopia Tonight.